Alrighty, gang. Uh, this video is exclusively devoted to the reading by Blair, Brown, and Baxter, Disciplining the Feminine. Um, I didn't have it printed off. I don't have a printed off copy, so I might need to be getting back onto my computer here periodically. But this thing was published back in 2009, so this is not a terribly new piece, but it's still a pretty earth-shattering essay that nicely sets up the other two um, by Chavez and Morris. And it also um, marks an important moment, I think, uh, within rhetoric's kind of postmodern, neo-sophistic turn that we've been talking about. So again, thinking about the weeks uh, after the 20th century stuff, we've got a week on epistemology, a week on space, materiality, bodies, sensations, and then finishing with a week on alternative rhetorics. And here, this week, this final week, the theme is power. Um, the, the supplementary chapters in Herrick and the Foss trap book, um, where they talk about Foucault and bell hooks, are those are the key chapters. Make sure you read those to get a handle I'm not going to talk at much here about Foucault, but Foucault's work in particular is really underpinning the critical analysis that we get in disciplining the feminine. Um, Foucault was the one who got us all thinking about the relationship between knowledge and power. Not I am once asked my class that I was like, "What do you think about the relationship between knowledge and power?" And someone said very straightforwardly, "Well, the more no knowledge you have, the more power you have." You know, it's like you go to school and you learn things and then you have power, right? It's like you can do things, you can start a business. It's like, that's not that's not how Foucault means it at all. It's more like knowledge, that which we get to, to learn, is always determined by sort of winners and losers and the haves and the have-nots and so on. So for Foucault, to have uh, power is to have a certain kind of knowledge. Right? And to have a certain kind of knowledge is to be subject to power. And where this gets really crazy uh, in terms of implications is thinking about science. Thinking about science as a kind of knowledge driven by a certain kind of power structure. That's where things start to get a little wobbly, right? But that's where this piece, Disciplining the Feminine, is headed. It's suggesting uh, very boldly that... Um, the, the discipline, that word discipline, I talk about it in the next video as well. The word discipline is, is, is important because obviously, you know, you think of discipline, they, in, in rhetoric, we talk about rhetoric as a discipline, right? It's like, it's an area of study, but obviously discipline means like, um, training and it means like to be subject to, right? Think of like karate kid, discipline. Paint on, paint the fence, wax on, wax on, like disciplining Daniel's son to learn how to do this, like series of moves over and over and over and over and over and over and over repetitiously. There's so the discipline is also that which power uses to train, right? So disciplining the feminine is getting at both senses of this idea of discipline, that area of study, but also to be the subject of power and sort of training by force, essentially, right? And Foucault's work is the one that really opens this up. Foucault is the one who gave us all of these analyses of how it is that knowledge becomes um, that which we inhabit through training and discipline. And, and, you know, it's not so much that we learn truth as we learn how to do very specific tasks and we learn very specific kinds of things that help us become a part of a certain privileged category of society or whatever, right? So Foucault is important and Bell Hooks is important in their critiques of dominant structures of knowledge because they're built on power relations. Um, and that's where we're at here. So the Blair, Brown, and Baxter essay becomes a kind of case study in disciplinary power. So let's just sort of talk about the story that's in their journal. An essay or a report was published in 1990, 1992 by, um, the, it's the Hickson Report. This is a report that was published on active female scholars. So basically saying like, these are the women in academia who are publishing the most, 
They're publishing in the best journals. They're publishing the most cited work. They have the biggest presence, right? And it's a report that was kind of, I think, meant to like acknowledge and celebrate active female scholars in the academy, right? So Blair, Brown, and Baxter find themselves after this report comes out troubled by its implications. And they start talking amongst themselves. And as always happens with journal articles, you know, it comes from some place of like frustration or like this needs to be said or I can't believe this hasn't been said yet or whatever. So the three of them get together and they decide to write up a critique of this scholarly ranking report. And they figure, you know, this, this scholarly ranking initiative is fraught with all kinds of what they're calling male paradigm problems, right? Um, and they actually refer to this, this report as a kind of beauty contest for academics, you know, because it's all about ranking, right? The top most prolific female scholar, the next most prolific female scholar, and the next and the next. And they are troubled by this idea of ranking female scholars in terms of their productivity. They think that this is um, a part of a kind of male paradigm that they don't really want to be a part of, right? So they're, so they're, so um, they, they write, to, write up this analysis, they send it off for publication, they're critical of this report, they, they send their analysis to a journal, the journal article comes back after it's reviewed anonymously, because that is a norm of academic publishing, is that you send your work off to a journal, the editor sends the anonymous work to anonymous reviewers. That's called blind review, double blind. Because the reviewers don't know who the author is, and the author doesn't know who the reviewers are. The whole process is meant to be anonymous, which means that you extract your personhood from the work, and it's meant to be judged on its own merits, right? Um, but as they continue, they, even that process is problematic in terms of power and, and certain disciplinary norms. So they send their journal off, their, their essay off to a journal. The essay comes back with these reviews that are really problematic. Um, and so now they see this as an instance of disciplinary discipline, right? Because they're sending their essay to a journal, it's coming back, and in the reviews from the journal, the anonymous reviews, they experience what they perceive as continued disciplinary power imbalances, um, and they see a male paradigm at work in ways that are troubling, frustrating, disgusting, upsetting and all the rest of it. So what they do then is they take their original essay plus the reviews and now they publish this new piece that reflects on the publishing process and the reviews that came back. So it actually incorporates those reviews as part of the eventual final paper that they publish, the one we have here. Now, um, Let's see, where was this thing published? Disciplinary, and this is Quarterly Journal of Speech. So they ended up getting it published in QJS, um, which is the top journal in rhetoric. And it ends up becoming an essay about the discipline of rhetoric itself, right? So it ends up becoming um, a critique of basically um, disciplinary policing, you know, by the editor and the, and the anonymous reviewers of their original essay, right? So that's kind of the story here. And along the way, the thing to kind of focus on is, um, first of all, their, their basic arguments and their, the, the premises of their argument. Number one is that academia, which is where we all work and live and you know, have our careers and so on, academia is not neutral. It's not 100% objective. Even if we go through these processes of anonymous peer reviewing, there are still lots of biases. And what they end up talking about is a kind of territoriality um, that, that keeps certain voices out and it keeps certain critiques out. Right? So they see the, the, scholarly, the female scholarly ranking report as a kind of beauty contest that lines up female scholars according to their productivity, and they have problems with this because they don't like the assumptions that are that are driving this report, this analysis. Assumptions that, you know, 
scholarship is all about just individual effort and it's about the most brilliant person doing the hardest work. And so clearly this woman, this one person who reaches the top is the most productive scholar who does the best work. They see this as a kind of male ranking system, very much like a beauty contest, and they don't really want to be part of it. So they're critiquing the ranking system in their original essay. And then when that critique gets savaged by these presumably male reviewers, then they take a step back and now they're critiquing this whole enterprise of anonymous peer reviewing as a norm of academic disciplinary work, right? So this is very Foucauldian. It's basically saying we're surrounded by power structures and even when we try to critique those power structures, we are subject to those same power structures, right? This is the only piece that I can think of that actually like takes the process of publishing, makes it a part of the final product that ends up getting published. So it becomes a kind of meta reflection on what it means to actually try to get something published, to be a woman, to be critical of a certain kind of scientific report, and then to try to get that um, criti criticism published only to be subject of further disciplinary um uh, reprisal, I guess, right? So this is them saying, nope, we're still critical and we're going to do you one better. We're going to actually critique the process that critiqued us for trying to critique the, the, the report, right? So the four aspects or elements of the male paradigm are worth noting here. They're, they're, they're saying that we experienced a male paradigm when we tried to be critical of this ranking report. The male paradigm is characterized by, number one, impersonal abstraction, Number two, territoriality. Number three, individuation. And number four, hierarchy. Now keep Burke's definition of man in the back of your mind here. This idea of goaded by a spirit of hierarchy is everywhere present, I think, in their, in their analysis. But they're basically saying that their original essay was subject to the male paradigm and these four characteristics. Impersonal abstraction or this idea of universals. Um... So the notion of anonymous peer reviewing is all about separating your, your subjective bias from the work so that we can, we can assess each other's scholarship neutrally, as though there were a kind of standard separated from humans, right? That humans could judge work in some kind of vacuum, right? So they're critical of the very process of anonymous peer reviewing because you can still figure out, you know, where people are coming from. It's kind of phony, right? It's like, oh, the, the guys who are reviewing clearly understood that these were women being critical, and so they were critical of their femininity because of their masculinity and so on. So they're, like, thinking this whole business of universality, of objective reason, is kind of a, is kind of a performance. It's kind of a, um, it's a bit of a ruse to begin with. The second one, territoriality, is interesting. This idea of kind of policing the boundaries. Like, this is not an acceptable project for this journal. I find myself doing this a lot, to be honest, as a, as a more senior scholar now, as I read a lot of manuscripts that come in, and I find myself saying, what does this have to do with rhetoric? What does this have to do with anything? What is this? Why Make the case for why this matters. And I find myself kind of like protecting the boundaries or the limitations of what I consider rhetoric to be. Is that part of the male paradigm? I'm a guy, so maybe. But I feel like more senior scholars oftentimes do the work of sort of saying to their junior, you know, junior, younger generations coming up, like, how does this fit in? Or how, demonstrate to me how this matters. So they felt like they were being territorialized by sending in a, an essay that was critical of a ranking report and then being told, go elsewhere. This is not... Um, legitimate scholarship for this journal. So they felt policed in that way. Uh, individuation is this is this kind of fantasy of the lone wolf author, right? So I can tell you that when every year at the end of, of, um, of a, a year of work, we as you know faculty scholars have to submit reports about all the publishing and the research that we've done. And there's a kind of ranking that goes with it. And the very top thing that you can do as a scholar is to publish a book by yourself with a top academic press, like Harvard, Oxford, you know, those Ivy League presses. Those are the top. That's as good as it gets. You publish a book, Donovan Conley, blah, 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 Harvard University of Press. That's 
the top of the heap, right? But it presumes a certain genius, a certain kind of lone wolf, lone wolf author that's able to rise above and conquer all obstacles and, and so on. And they don't like that narrative. They don't like that idea. They like they prefer a notion of scholarship as collaborative, right? We're always leaning on each other. It reminds me of um, Elizabeth Warren once gave a speech where she talked about um, this criticism of conservatives who always say, like, I'm a small business owner. Leave me alone. Give me my taxes, you know, my tax break. And Elizabeth Warren says, no small business owner ever did anything on their own, right? In order to get the goods to your shop, we you need roads. We all pay for the roads, right? And so on and so on and so on. So it's kind of that idea of no scholar does anything on their own. Everyone is participating in the, in the scholarship of other people. So the ranking system ignores that fact that we all collaborate. We all get help from each other. So they have problems with the paradigm that ranked these female scholars. They have problems with the assumptions, the values, and the norms that are embedded in a ranking system. Finally, hierarchy. The very notion of a top, second, third, fourth. This is Burke, right? Goaded by a spirit of hierarchy. They have problems with the idea that, oh, because this because Jennifer, whatever made up name, you know, is the number one scholar, then she's better, right? And whoever falls at the bottom is is the worst. It totally ignores the possibility that there could be brilliant, mind-blowing, earth-shattering scholarship that's in the middle just because that person didn't publish that much or didn't publish in the right journals or whatever. So they are critical of the whole kind of apparatus that the, that the ranking report is built on. Right, quantity over quality, hierarchy, lone wolf, um, in the sense of what's right and wrong and good and bad or whatever. They see all of this stuff as being extensions of and expressions of a male, male paradigm, patriarchal, boundary policing, um, you know, overly uh, enamored of science and objectivity, and clueless to the fact that we are all subjects. We are all subjects. Um, doing work together, producing scholarship together. So they see a, this whole process of anonymous peer reviewing as kind of a fiction and a fantasy of objectivity, which for them is finally never possible. Even science itself, and Foucault would be on board with this idea, that even science, which is conducted by individuals and subjects who are fallible and work together and so on and so on, can never ultimately be finally, finally, uh, perfectly objectively true. There's always going to be sort of some human element in there that's going to mess things up and so on. Um, so, sorry, I'm getting messages all over the place, getting, trying to just focus here. So it becomes this really interesting case study in a critique of disciplinary practices that are also professional politics. So they say it early early on in this piece that the professional is political. So they're seeing their own um, their own jobs, their own professional landscape and the mechanisms and institutional uh, practices within academia as fraught with power. And they want to call it out. So this is sort of like, you know, rhetoric rhetorical theory goes woke <laughs> back in like uh, over 10 years ago or around 10 years ago. Um, and it becomes um, a really interesting and potentially troubling look at the ways that power and bias um, infiltrate like all, all of our kind of normal operating practices, even in the academy, right? So we're always subject to discipline and disciplinary practices and therefore power. Um, and they want to push back on that. And they even end off by saying like there's no great answer here. Um, we're just trying to identify and make transparent these power structures that exist um, and render them visible so that we can maybe do better moving forward. So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a slightly longer piece, but I think once you get that uh, narrative, the story kind of down, then it reads pretty quickly. Um, and it's very compelling and provocative still. To this day, I find this piece really quite astonishing and, and you know worth acknowledging. It's, it's quite something. So... Uh, that's it for, for this essay and this video. Um, there's two more sets of readings. I've already uploaded that video, so we're all done here. Um, always looking forward to your questions, and we have one more paper coming up, so I'll get that up there, and then we're good, gang. So be studying for that final exam and your final paper, and we will be saying goodbye fairly soon. So hope all is well out there.